When I was a student at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, I had a job in the school's print shop. One of our regular duties was printing the commencement program at the end of every semester. It was our job to make the negatives, burn the plates, print the pages, collate them, cut them, and then staple them together. Well, I came to the end of my three-year stint as a seminarian, and as a carload of my relatives was heading west out of Georgia toward Texas for my graduation, I joined my fellow workers at the print shop to assemble the commencement program. There were huge stacks of the pages on a table, and I was joking around with everybody before we started work when my boss, Phil, walked up and said, Paris, I don't know what happened, but I've looked through all the list of graduates on these pages, and your name isn't there. And now, I had burned the negatives on all the pages. I had run the plates for the printer, and I remember seeing my name right down at the bottom of one of the columns. And so I said, oh, you just didn't look hard enough. It's right here on, and my name wasn't there. I thought maybe I was looking on the wrong page, and so I looked at another stack. My name wasn't there either. Everybody was listed in alphabetical order, so it should have been easy to find my name, but it didn't matter whether I looked in the D's or the M's, I wasn't there. I said, I, I, I don't understand. I could have sworn that and I saw my name right here on this page. Phil turned to one of the printers and asked Dave, did the dean's office send down a revised list of graduates? <laughs> Dave said, it's happened before. Maybe Brad ran a new plate. Well, now I was really panicking. You see, all through my seminary days, I had heard rumors about poor schnooks who took a late final exam and flunked and got yanked out of line, the line of graduates just as they were donning their robes and their mortarboards. And I had had a late final that semester. Suddenly there arose before me the specter of going home to tell my wife to stop packing because we were going to stay in Texas a while longer. And what was I going to tell my family when they tumbled out of the car after that long trek from Georgia? Guess what happened to me today? You'll think this is funny. <laughs> or, you don't, good news, you don't have to sit through any boring old graduation ceremony after all. My stomach was turning flip-flops, and I began frantically rifling through those stacks again just to make sure I wasn't going crazy. And then I heard the first snicker. I looked up and the whole print shop crew roared with laughter. They slapped each other on the back. They gave each other high fives. They whooped at me like hound dogs tree and a raccoon. <laughs> Turns out what they had done was to run the plates that I had made. And then while I was in class, they had taped over my name on the negative, burned a whole new plate and run a couple of hundred of extra pages like that and put them on the top of the stack. Of course, then I had to act like I was unfazed, you know. Oh, I knew it all along, which, of course, they just laughed at me that much louder. <laughs> I had worked hard for three years. All I wanted was my name written in the program. All I wanted was to be recognized for my accomplishment. I wanted to be remembered for what I had done, and I'm no different from anybody else. We all want to be remembered for our accomplishments. We all want stories told about us, about the things that we've done and the sights that we've seen. We all want to remember special events in our lives and in our families that stand out from the usual day-to-day -day mundane routines of life. My family does that. I can't tell you the number of times I heard the stories about my great-great-grandfather, Henry Paris who served as a captain in the Confederate Army. He was captured in Kentucky and taken to a POW camp in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And when he was paroled eight months later, he literally walked from Vicksburg all the way back to Georgia, on foot. I have at home a copy of the signed document that he signed swearing never to take up arms against the United States again. Those kinds of experiences are what people remember. Not for what you, not, you don't remember what you had for supper last Tuesday. You remember those standout events. 
Penny's father, Placido Bonadonna, did I say that right, honey? Close? All right. Was drafted into Mussolini's army in Italy. But he never told his family, or at least his children, anything about the war. Only late in his life did he share some of his experiences, and only then to his grandson. Turns out Placido was stationed on the Russian front, but he decided that he didn't bear the Russians any ill will, and besides, he didn't really want to be there anyway. And so one night on guard duty, he deliberately submerged his hand in the snow long enough to get a really fine case of frostbite so that he couldn't fire a rifle anymore. And he spent the rest of the war in North Africa as a cook. We tell stories like that. We tell stories about significant things that happen to us and that happen to our families. And if your family is anything like mine, you tell those stories over and over and over again. And when somebody new comes into the family, you think fresh meat and you make sure that you tell them those stories over and over again. We want to be remembered for the things we've seen and the things we've done. We want our name in the program. All of the women that we have been looking at for the last few weeks had some great stories to tell. Imagine being the first to find the tomb empty and hear the news of Jesus' resurrection. Amazing. We don't know how many women there were. The gospel stories are all different. And Luke even mentions some that he calls the other women. Nameless they are to us, but not to their families and not to their fellow Christians. Can you hear the conversation around the birthday party table? You sing, family sings happy birthday, and then the matriarch says, I remember the birthday of our faith. It was a beautiful, bright, sunny Sunday morning, and all the family says, oh, not again, Grandma. But it's important. We remember those events because they're special. We remember them because of what was seen. We remember them because of what was done. Over in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent 70 of his followers out to preach the gospel and heal the sick. And when they returned, they were bubbling with excitement. They gushed, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. And Jesus said, yes, what you have done is absolutely wonderful. It was as if I saw Satan fall like a flash of lightning from heaven. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In other words, they had seen and done some amazing things, things to be remembered, but as incredible as it all was, the only thing that mattered was that their names were written in heaven. The other women that Luke mentions had seen and done some amazing things, but that's not what counted. Their names were written in heaven. That's what counted. Having been involved in such a colossal event, it seems a shame not to know their names, but in the end, that's not what matters anyway. God knows their names because their names are written in heaven. Just like your name is written in heaven. (coughs) Did you know that? You've seen some remarkable events in your life. You've had some extraordinary achievements in your life. You have plenty to be remembered for, but in the final analysis, none of that matters. What matters is that your name is written in heaven. What matters is who you are in God's sight, much more than what you have accomplished or ever will accomplish. What matters is God's grace, not your strength and your skills, as dazzling as they may be. Sooner or later, we all end up in that pile of the others, nameless, faceless, lost in the midst of history. And yet God knows who you are because your name is written in heaven. I told you, few minutes ago about the job that I had at the seminary print shop. Some of you have heard the story of how I got hired for that job. 
It was during my first year at seminary, I worked as a janitor in the music building, and I got tired of that, and started scouting around looking for something else to do. My best friend, Mike Bailey, worked in the public relations office at the school, and his desk was located in the seminary print shop. And one day he said to me, hey, Paris, I hear the print shop is looking for somebody to run their new Xerox machine, and they'll train whoever gets the job. Why don't you go down there and apply? Now, you have to know that this was in the days long before any Joe Schmo could go to Best Buy and purchase a copier for his own home. Copiers were big, they were expensive, and if they had any bells and whistles on them at all, they needed a trained operator to work them. The only problem I had was that I'd never been anywhere near a print shop in my life, and the only copier I'd ever run was the kind down at the local library where you put in a dime, pressed a button, and out came a gray copy on slick paper about as thick as your thumb. How many of you remember those things? But I figured I had nothing to lose, so I went down into the catacombs of the admin building where the print shop was located to meet with Phil. And we talked for a while. I was utterly honest with him about how I, was, I had a complete lack and dearth of any kind of printing knowledge and skills. And I figured once I said that, Phil would smile politely and say, well, thanks for coming in anyway. But he didn't. Phil kept talking to me. We talked about work, we talked about school, we talked a little theology, after all this was a seminary. And finally said, well, the job is yours if you want it. Well, of course, I was absolutely thrilled, but I could not for the life of me understand why I got the job and got it so quickly. I wanted to think I had been so charming in my good old boy Southern kind of way, or so good looking, or maybe sounded so intelligent that Phil completely overlooked my inability to tell a pinch roller from a paper tray. More realistically, I figured that since Mike Bailey had told me about the job, I was just the first guy to apply. And so Phil didn't have any other prospects. Well, I'd been working there for a couple of months, and one day Phil and I got into a conversation, and he asked me how I was getting along in the work, and I said, oh, Phil, I, I really do like this job. I'm sure glad I got here before anybody with experience applied for this job. And he just smiled and pulled open his desk drawer and produced a stack of applications two inch thick, most of them with extensive printing experience. I was flabbergasted. I said, so what did I do or what did I say that made you want me over these guys? And Phil said, nothing. Mike Bailey recommended you. And that was good enough for me. What you've seen and done is astounding. And it's as if Satan falls like a flash of lightning from heaven. But that's not why God remembers your name. God remembers your name because Jesus has vouched for you. And so your name is written in heaven.